What is the condition of free speech in America today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. And on this video series, Speaking Freely, we talk from time to time with people who offer us unique perspectives on the free speech drama unfolding in America. This time we sat down with Brad Shear, an attorney who's carved out a specialized niche in First Amendment law, digital privacy for young people. Brad Shear, you've made a specialty in the area of what you call digital privacy, and uh, especially as it applies to students at various stages of their lives and careers. Can you tell me what you mean about that, what you're referring to? Sure. What I really mean is the fact that when people think about free speech and freedom of speech, speech really isn't free. There's a cost. Ooh. And so for Every single time That's a student... really, a, you know, you're, you're hitting me in the jugular. <laughs> Free speech is my game. I, 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 I want to hit you in the jugular because I want people to be woken up and for them to realize, especially young people, that everything that you post online is not private, especially whenever you use Facebook or Instagram or Twitter uh, or you use Google for um, Gmail. The, the information that you're putting online is not private and therefore when you lose your privacy you use your you lose your ability to really speak freely and the things that you talk about but but this raises an interesting question because we're not guaranteed privacy in the constitution are we we're not guaranteed privacy however we do have an expectation of privacy under the 4th amendment for a lot of things that we do so even though there's no guarantee but the 4th amendment deals with searches and seizures correct and that's more focused on the government right. and not private entities. Right. And so outside um, in Europe, they do have some new laws coming into effect, which will really help out young people, students, and everyone else regarding privacy issues. Because at the end of the day, when you lose your privacy, you lose your ability to really speak freely. Because, for example, a lot of people who are outside in, in different countries, for example, in Iran or or um, Russia or China, they have some really strong laws out there that really restrict what people can say and do, and they're going out of their way, uh, some of these governments, to restrict the use of VPNs, privacy enhancing VPNs mechanisms. VPNs uh, are virtual private networks. Yes, exactly. Uh, virtual private networks and other privacy enhancing tools, so that way the people in those countries it makes it more difficult for them to speak freely. So that's why we're very lucky we live in a country that allows for privacy enhancing tools such as VPNs. But, but let me ask you this. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic to what you say about privacy. I mean, mm -hmm. who, who can't be? And, right. and of course, our, our lives don't feel nearly as private as they once did. And I'm not sure whose interest is served by our lives not being so private. However, isn't it just to be expected in a time like this, in an electronic age, isn't it to be expected that what we say is going to be out there, that people are going to be able to find it and uh, uh, hold us responsible for what we've said? That, that's an excellent point, Sandy, and I agree that uh, the fact is that when you post things online and you put things out there, it makes it much more easy to find. However, I want to see my children grow up in a world where everything that they do when they're three, four, five, fifteen, eighteen years old doesn't stay with them for the rest of their lives. Just think about this point. Imagine if um, President Clinton, President um, Bush, President Obama, and President Trump, imagine if they grew up in a world or a time where everything that they did while growing up through their twenties and thirties was collected and then used later on, analyzed, and if they ever wanted to run for political office or get a job, 
I highly doubt if every little thing that, th that they ever said was collected or done, whether or not they said it or whether they may maybe sent an email or maybe talked to someone and it was secretly recorded. Imagine that type well, of data. Well, secretly recorded is a whole other matter. We can, we can get to right. that in a moment. But I don't know. Um, I think we do know a lot. Uh, we certainly know a lot about what Bill Clinton did and said. Uh, George W. Bush, I don't know if it's as interesting uh, mm -hmm. to know all the details of what he did and said, but it might be. And certainly um, Donald Trump, I mean, uh, you know, could we have a day without finding out something more about Donald Trump? It it's, <laughs> doesn't seem to me there are likely to be a lot more secrets there. Now, when you say three, four, and five years old, I think that you know, that's a period when uh, maybe there should be an exemption. But teenagers, I don't know. I, I, I think... Uh, the teenage brain is not fully formed yet. So the things that they are thinking, I mean, as a parent, I have two, two children in elementary school. But as a parent, I don't want to have everything that they say while they're in elementary school, middle school, and high school to be held against them for the rest of their lives. The reason why kids go to college is to learn and become productive members I, of I society. I certainly agree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I do agree with that. But what is it we're worried about being found out about or being revealed? Uh, what is the sure? Um, what is the risk? Well, the risk is you can easily be discriminated against. For example, based upon your political leanings, um, based upon your religion, based upon a disability, based upon your sexual orientation. And all those things are very easily collected, for example, on Facebook. If you like, uh, for example, there was a lawsuit years back um, from someone who was uh, working at the Library of Congress. He liked something called My Two Dads. And he claimed that he was discriminated against because his, he felt like his boss, once he found out his sexual orientation, was, not, um, was very difficult towards him. And so it's small little things like that where I've had students come to me and because they've gotten in trouble, uh, because they uh, discussed something, uh, they like liked something on Facebook or did a literally a like. I had one issue where someone did a like and an LOL on something that was political and it was um, it was a combination of political and inappropriate what was said. And unfortunately, the student's um, family had contacted me after they spoke with the um, with the college. And the problem was that they had already said, they already admitted to the fact that they said something because someone had reached out to them anonymously and said, okay, well, this person, this applicant who got in, right. said something online, <coughs> and what are you going to do about it? And this young, young person lost a scholarship that was worth approximately $250,000 and the ability to go to school, their hopes and dreams. So let, 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 let me see if we can pick this apart. So somebody, a friend or an acquaintance, probably mm -hmm. not such a good friend, uh, tipped off a college yes. to which the student had been admitted and where he'd been, he or she had been granted a scholarship Yes, and drew the college's attention to something this young person had said online. He didn't actually say it. What he did was he liked it and then did an LOL. So he never made the statement. Okay, he just basically said, I'm going to like this comment and I'm going to like this post and did LOL. That was it. And because of that, he lost a scholarship and his place in. Well, that's pretty sinister. Was, what, what was the nature of what he liked? It had to do with, it was, a, it was something along the lines with politics during the, um, during the election in 2016. And it had some um, potential racial undertones. And it was something that I personally would never um, encourage anyone to uh, post or write or, or discuss. But we're talking about a 17-year-old. And what goes through a what were you able? What were you able to do for this young person? Were you able to get the scholarship back? Unfortunately, they had already, um, the, the school had already reached out to this young person, and the young person had already responded. And the fact that they, there wasn't a state law in place, and there was too many moving parts, and by the time they reached out to me, there wasn't much I could do. If they would have reached out to me before they responded, to the demand to verify or authenticate the post, then I could have possibly done something. But this is going on more and more where colleges are going to students and applicants and saying, look, um, uh, we believe you posted something that was inappropriate online. Um, 
we need you to verify it. Like what happened? What's what, the sort of statute of limitations for this? Can it be something that was done many years earlier or just a few months ago during the application season? That's What's the problem. Experience? It could possibly be anything that's like several, up to several years old. What is your advice to young people, to teenagers, uh, to people applying to colleges? Uh, what, what is it that you suggest they do? I suggest that they minimize their digital footprint, lock down their social media accounts. Um, I actually um, provide a lot of consulting services in that area. I also have an online course where I focus on teaching my clients on how to literally become invisible online or not necessarily invisible but try to minimize their digital footprint. For example, I think it's very important for young people to have Finsta accounts. A Finsta account is a fake Instagram account and fake social media accounts and have accounts that can't easily be found by admissions so, officials. So, wait a minute, Brent. So you're advocating deception on the part of students? No, I'm advocating privacy and security but and safety. fake. You're using the word fake. You're advocating that they that's, have That's the accounts. term. The term is Finsta means fake Instagram. I like to say they're alternative social media accounts. They're not fake. They're alternative yeah, accounts. They're called that, fake, but they're not fake. Some people call them fake. Other people call them al alternative social media accounts or private social media accounts. Mm -hmm. I, it's a nuance, but in my opinion, I encourage people, whether you're young or you're old. Here, I'll give you a perfect example. James Comey, he had a Finsta Twitter account. Why? Because he obviously wanted to post on Twitter. And while he was FBI director? He while he was FBI director, I, yes. While, as far as I know, while... How do you know? If there was, was an private? article. In the, oh, okay. There was an article. Right. There was an article so that... So somebody penetrated this account. I, well, I think what happened was that he spoke with... Um, I think he spoke with the various people who knew about his account. And then they eventually wrote an article about it after he left the FBI. Um, there was an article written, I believe it was last fall. I could always send the article to you, and you That's could see right. it was so a very, we're, we're yeah, it's a very interesting article where it just says he had an Instagram account. It was like his name was maybe like Reinhold Neubauer or something along those lines. It was an interesting name, but um, if if someone like that has a social media account that is not publicized, and for example, Rex uh, Tillerson. So are we? I, are we? Let me make sure, sure I understand this. Are you? endorsing this for James Comey to do this? Do you think it's a good thing? It's a good thing for students to do it, but not a good thing for him to do it? Or? Uh, oh, I'm just saying I'm not endorsing whether or not someone should do it or not. I'm just saying it's one way to protect your privacy and your security is if you have certain things to say. Uh, like, for example, our country was founded with the Federalist Papers, right. okay? And why did they write, the, uh, write what they wrote under, under pseudonyms? Because they didn't want to have their names tied to certain things at the time that they wrote about it. And so we have a long history of, of, of people going out of their way to protect their privacy for freedom of speech. But I always thought those pen names that were used by people writing the Federalist Papers were, were well known, easily penetrated, that they're, they're, they're very narrow public, mm -hmm. it probably counted in the hundreds mm -hmm. rather than the thousands or millions, knew who was writing that it was a a little bit of a, a game at the time. Is that is that not the case? Well, we don't know that because that was hundreds of years ago and we really don't know how many people really knew what their identities were. It's just like with alternative social media accounts. Uh, certain, Of course, a certain number of people will know who's it, whose account it is, but for example, employers or college admissions officials or the government, they may not know. I mean, that's why we've had the administration try to unmask people going to a particular website. Um, earlier this year. People want to know um, what websites you're going to, they want to know where you're tweeting from and where you're posting from, and when it comes to political um, issues and when it comes to other, pro other things that could be private in nature, for example, what your religion is, or if you have a particular sexual orientation that is not publicized, I think people should have that right to stay private and be able to discuss those things because those are the most personal things so we have. So you think that without this kind of, I'm, I'm going to use the word deception which sounds uh -huh. unattractive, but without that particular kind of, you would say, constructive deception that we have no privacy. These I don't days. like the term constructive deception. I like the term um, privacy enhancing um, service or um, something because privacy and security and safety go hand in hand mm -hmm. because uh, when I said earlier about there really isn't any, uh, n there really isn't anything such as free speech because all speech has a cost. Because once you go out on a limb and you talk about something, you may lose opportunities based upon 
your personal okay, opinions. Okay, so that leads, I think, to a philosophy of self-censorship. Unfortunately, that yes. Yes, that, that you're advocating that people censor themselves and not speak their minds at any age, really, but especially at a young age. Well, it's not, so to speak, self-censorship. I don't. I think censorship is a dirty word, well, and I, 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 I'm not a big fan of the word censorship. I'm more of a fan of the word, um, I, I guess, along the lines, being careful or, or being, uh, being uh, judicious with how you're conducting yourself, but. For example, I mean, we, we had recently, it was literally just last week in the news, a, a young woman who had uh, an Instagram account at the University of Alabama, and she said some disgusting, hateful things that I would never advocate anyone saying or even believing. And she, was within 24 hours, literally, she was thrown out of her, out of her sorority, and she was kicked out, of, kicked out of her school. Well, it's one thing to be thrown out of your sorority. That's a private entity. However, she was kicked out of a public institution, the University of Alabama. And should the University of Alabama, do they have the legal right as a public entity to kick a student out for saying, for voicing Well, their public opinion? institution, that's more, obviously more problematic than in exactly. a private institution. Private institution, totally, yeah. That's public institutions are clearly and explicitly covered by the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. But, um, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with the case at this moment, and I don't know what she said. Um, but does she have the right to say hateful things privately? She if has, they were hateful things. She has the right. I mean, I, I'm a big believer in what some people have attributed to Voltaire. I may not agree with what you have right. to say, but I'll defend to the death your right to right. say it. I, I truly believe that we live in a very special country that has these First Amendment protections, and I'm under the uh, opinion that people should feel free to speak their mind. However, people that do speak their mind online there's generally a cost when there's certain things said that other people don't like and, and the internet mob can go after you. But what is the internet, did you say the internet mob? The internet mob, yes. Sorry, <laughs> uh, I almost missed that one. Tell me yes. about the internet mob for a second. For example, every time that you see something um, that someone might say online that's uh, a lot of people might not agree with, whether it's politics or race or sexual orientation, and it get, and for some reason someone picks it up and someone retweets it, it gets retweeted a bunch of times, all of a sudden that person can become the target of a lot of angry people who never even knew this person. So and the internet mob are, is composed of people we used to call trolls. Trolls, tr that's another term. Right. Trolls, internet mob. People um, looking looking for trouble, looking for... Or, or rabble rousers or troublemakers right, or whatever, right. it, but it just depends and people have the right to say what they want in response to what other people said. That's the beauty of our country. That's why I love so, this but, country. But, well, I, I think we all do, but when you um, say they should, it, I, you don't want me to use the word self-censorship, but... Oh, feel free to use it. It's okay. <laughs> but when, they, when you say that they should be careful what they say uh -huh. at a young age, <clears throat> is that necessarily the lesson we want young people to get when we're, when we're advocating free speech? Just. Be careful what I, you say. I agree. I, I don't want my children to grow up in a world where they have to self-censor themselves. And I think part of the reason is because of all the technology out there where everyone has a cell phone and it's so easy to collect, to literally video record what someone is saying and someone can use that for, uh, for years on end to maybe blackmail a person. I mean, it's so easy to collect information off of a cell phone and the text messages that you're sending back and forth. So what you're saying is be careful, don't make a mistake. I'm saying... Especially when you're young. Well, I, I always advocate trying to be careful with what you're saying in emails and text messages and anything that's recorded. I mean, I think it's always a good idea to just be very cognizant of what your surroundings are because it's not just what you're saying in the digital space, it's also what you're saying offline that can be recorded and then republished or reposted. And I, I really don't want to live in an Orwellian world. And that's why I really try to help my students and try to help my clients and the people who I educate on trying to take extra precautions when you're dealing with especially online platforms because of the type of information they're collecting. They're also selling a lot of that information and data to data brokers. And once, once that information is picked up and collected and sent over to a data broker, it can end up anywhere and anyone can buy it, whether it's an employer can buy it, whether it's a financial services company, whether it's a college, uh, whomever.
But the implication is, I think, that if this is happening, mm -hmm. uh, that you want everybody to come across as bland, as not having strong opinions, or not, not having a distinct personal profile. That you, have, in order to succeed, to be hired mm -hmm. by these companies, to be admitted to these colleges, et cetera, according to this theory, right? Um, you have to, you just have to project yourself as sort of all gray or beige or. You know, mm -hmm. you won't you won't attract much attention. Is that a good thing? Absolutely not. And that's that's the challenge here. It's finding the happy medium. I mean, I'm all for people having distinct personality and for people having strong opinions and for people being able to voice their voice their opinions openly and in a manner that really makes society a better place. I mean, I personally have very strong opinions about free speech and my strong opinion, such as the fact that I've advocated for a lot of these state social media privacy laws. I've worked with members of Congress on a bill that hopefully would one day uh, become an act of the Social Networking Online Protection Act. I worked with uh, Congressman Elliot Engel's office on. I really would love to see um, our society become more tolerant of people making mm -hmm. online mistakes. And that's the challenge here because I, I would rather see young people be free to say whatever they want online and people feel like they don't have to self-censor. However, the challenge is that we have too many people out there who if you say one thing incorrectly or wrong or someone takes offense to it, you could be blackballed. And you so could how be do we get to your mm -hmm. utopia where people can <laughs> should be saying what they believe and, and should be distinct personalities mm -hmm. get their opinions out. How do we get to that without those people getting into trouble? That's the problem. I, that's the challenge. So you don't really mean it that you think people should do that. You think they should be able to do it, but watch out. I think that people should be able to feel free to speak their mind. However, there's consequences. There's consequences with everything that you say and everything that you do online and in the real world. It's things that you say, it's things that you do, it's how you conduct yourself. And if you're a college or you're an employer, you're not going to want to hire someone that is, unless it's for the CEO position or top management position, the person has this very robust digital life or very robust personality. But if you're someone just starting out and you already have these positions staked out, that could raise a red flag and that could be a turnoff to some employers in some schools because of the fact that they want to be able to mold you into the type of student or employee that they really want for their organization. So that's, that's the challenge here. And that's why I really believe the fact that you have to really think long and hard about how you really conduct yourself in the digital space and in the digital age because we just don't know how that information is going to be utilized down the road because everything is being collected. Right. Um, well, <clears throat> I certainly can understand that you don't want to make yourself vulnerable unnecessarily, but I think a lot of people would worry mm -hmm. about this inhibition and that, you know, everyone's going to be just sort of have the same opinions, be in the mm -hmm. middle of the road, uh, come across, so that then it'll be very, very hard to distinguish between and among people mm -hmm. because they're all saying the safe safest things. That, that is taking things to an extreme. Yeah. I'm more of the opinion that I think people should have opinions and they should feel free to state those opinions. However, the challenge is if you're going to state an opinion politically and you do it under your own name, under your own account, and when you're a young person, what's going to happen when you have a member of the College Admissions Committee and they don't like that opinion and they don't like that candidate that you're supporting? Okay. Presumably most colleges, most institutions want a wide range of opinions represented on their campus anyway. That's what we hope. That's what we hope, but do we always have that? We don't know because well, a there's question. a lack of transparency and accountability right. as far as why is a person really being accepted or rejected. We just don't know and that's the prerogative of every school and that's why it's best well, to it really... it has to be. I mean, you can't, why is anybody hired for a job? Exactly. You, know, you can't just yeah. say, because I've applied, I'm entitled to be hired. I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. That's why um, my opinion is you really want, for example, a college to focus on your application materials, the stuff that you've submitted. It's like it's like in a court of law. You only want the evidence that's actually submitted that's to really to be, be considered. To be considered. Right. That's that's literally just the the thought process regarding how social media and how your internet search right. history and your digital um, di digital activities should factor into the college admissions process. Do you think that people should be able to be forgotten online? The the, the sort of the right to be forgotten, the right to be ignored, the right to. Mm -hmm. uh, 
expunge something silly or 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 libelous or untrue about oneself. I, I, well, in Europe, they have that right to to a degree, and I think that should be a very there should be a re very robust conversation here in the United States about that issue. I think that uh, but the challenge is the right to be forgotten versus the First Amendment. For example, let's say someone who has um, committed a crime, okay, and they're written about in the newspaper. Well. Should should that person have the right to suppress the news? The news? I well, don't think so. Well, or should that person yeah. have the right to be forgiven at some stage, uh, or if it's wrong, mm -hmm. get it erased? If he, if, if I, I hate to think that we'd have to prove that we're innocent of right. things, but there are a lot of false accusations online too. Of course, and, and that is a huge problem. However, unfortunately, under Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. Um, websites don't have to expunge uh, information that is generally false or libelous because they're not considered the speaker of that content. So there's a lot of moving parts. I mean, you sure. have to have Congress literally rewrite that. And right. do we really, really want to rewrite that? It's a big public policy question that is really very These challenging. These are big questions that yeah. don't seem to be on the table right now. Exactly. One last, one last issue. Uh, you've been critical of Julie Briskman, who was a young woman who achieved her 15 minutes of fame, or maybe it was 10 minutes of fame in her case, for uh, making an obscene gesture toward President Trump's motorcade. And uh, I wasn't, I wasn't critical of not the of fact her that, gesture. Right, of her gesture. You were critical uh, of her acknowledging that it was she who did it. I wasn't critical. I was just Sorry. along the lines. It's okay. Of thinking that, you know what, just because you're caught in a viral moment, okay, the fact that she stuck her middle finger to the president in a motorcade, you couldn't tell it was her that actually did it. You could just see her backside. However, she self-identified to her employer, and that's what ended up getting her fired. However, everything's going to be okay with her because of the, what happened was afterwards, because of all the media attention that she got, she's going to be just fine. She, I believe there was maybe some type of fundraising campaign that helped her out and she be, uh, gained some notoriety. However... And is she getting another job as a result? Uh, I'm not sure, but I'm, I believe she's had a lot of job offers from what I, from the last that mm -hmm. I heard that she's, she, I mean, she's going to end up all right. But what I'm saying, when you're in that situation where if something has gone viral, it's not always a great idea if other people don't know it's you and it's something where you could possibly lose your job or lose the ability to attend a certain college or other opportunities. You have to weigh the fact, do you really want to self-identify? And that's a personal, that's something personal that everyone has to so, determine. So you think in her case maybe she was too self-revealing. She told too much about herself and it caused, in the short run it caused her trouble, in the long run it gave her a kind of notoriety, fame that is, will, will end up being rewarded. Exactly, that, but that is, that is literally... That's the rare case. That's the rare case. That's threading the needle, and that's basically winning the lottery, the fact that you got fired from uh, your job based upon a incident that, gone, that went viral, and then all of a sudden all these people were going out defending you, and you're going to be okay. That is the rare case, and right. I'm very happy for her right. to be able to succeed. I suspect that many people, many other people, and the president have made obscene gestures at each other without paying consequences. I'm sure everyone has. I know, I know I've made uh, gestures in the past that I'm not always, not always proud of, and I see young people making gestures that they may not be proud of once they've had the time to think about it. But the problem is in the digital age, when, you're, when you have your cell phone in front of you and you're literally able to bang out 140 characters or less, um, or literally just it's 280 at the now, nose, I 280, think. Yeah. right? But uh, I still like to think about the 140 because it seems so beautiful at the time. But now that it's a lot longer, it's a different type of uh, thinking. But the fact that you can literally just send out a text message, and with a couple of emojis, and that could mean a whole bunch of different things. And I just feel like people need to understand what those consequences may be. Thank so, you, Brad. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Pleasure. We've been discussing digital privacy for young people with attorney Brad Shear. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, please visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.